As Rudy said, I've been ready for this my whole life. <sighs> Good afternoon, and I apologize for being eight minutes late. This is the first time this committee has ever started late, uh, and I want to extend my humblest apologies to those waiting. Uh, however, I did bring donuts. For those of you who are unaware, Staten Island has its own version of Dunkin' Donuts, uh, country donuts which is similar in every way except for the fact that it's more delicious than Dunkin' Donuts. The eggs that you would eat are actually fresh uh, and come from a, a, a chicken uh, and not from some sort of canned powder. Uh, there are a number of variety there uh, celebrating St. Patrick's Day. I believe there's Lucky Charms on some of the donuts. Others are Boston cream. Uh, so by all means, you know, please don't hesitate. In fact, if you guys want to get one now, I mean, I'll, I'll wait if you guys want to. Don't, I mean, please, please do, please do. Because the first question is going to be, I want you to describe them in your, in your testimony. <laughs> so I am Council Member uh, Joseph Borelli, and I'm Chair of the Committee on Fire and Emergency Management, also a donut connoisseur. I am today joined by my colleagues, Council Members, well, no one's here. We're here to discuss the oversight topic of EMS worker safety. We always start with a joke, but we are involved in a very serious topic today. Examining this issue is of particular importance today as the number of assaults against EMS workers appears to have increased in recent years, with 87 such assaults having occurred in 2018. We have heard a number of brutal incidents where we've unfortunately seen videos of EMS workers being violently attacked when trying to provide medical care to patients. As EMS first responders are often the front line of responding to 911 calls for the individuals with emotional disturbances or other mental health problems, it is essential that as a city we can work continuously to ensure the safety of these vital public servants. To that end, today the committee hopes to explore the steps that the fire department has taken and plan to continue to take moving forward to ensure that paramedics and EMTs are receiving the necessary training and resources to be protected when doing their job. This may include professional training, de-escalation, uh, self-defense tactics, or funding for protective vests. Ultimately, we are here to support these first responders and work to avoid further increases uh, of assaults against EMS workers. I would now like to ask those members of the administration who plan to testify, please state your name for the record. Uh, raise your right hand if it doesn't have a donut, uh, as the committee council administers the oath. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before this committee and to respond honestly to council member questions? Thank you. That's nice of you all. Uh, please begin. Good afternoon, Chair Borelli and all the council members present. My name is James Booth, and I am the Chief of EMS for the Fire Department of the City of New York. I'm joined today by Elizabeth Cassio, Chief of Staff, and Lillian Bonsignor, Chief of the EMS Academy. Thank you for the opportunity to speak with you today about protecting EMS members from job-related violence. EMS members in New York City provide life-saving care in a dynamic environment. They work in every area of the city, and they face new challenges every day. Unfortunately, sometimes those challenges include being threatened or even being assaulted during the course of a response. The fire department emphasizes that safety of our members is paramount at all times. The members are trained to minimize risk and to deal with dangerous situations when they arise. As a department, we are always looking for ways to enhance the safety of our members. The mission of EMS is to provide emergency medical care to the members of the community who are in need of help. As a general rule, we encourage our members to de-escalate the situation rather than act with force. However, Operating in dangerous situations means that, on occasion, it may become necessary as a last resort in the face of imminent harm for members to employ an appropriate degree of force to protect themselves. EMS members receive training when they first enter the job, as well as periodic training throughout the remainder of their career. New members receive instruction in a segment called Street Smarts that teaches the importance of physical positioning during a response <clears throat> the subtitle of the Street Smarts presentation is Protecting Yourself in a Continuously Changing Environment. And it addresses a wide variety of potentially dangerous situations such as aggressive patients, 
false calls to lure members, and dealing with animals. It provides instruction about surveying the scene, maintaining egress, continuing communications at a crowded scene, and maintaining situational awareness. The Street Smarts program also provides basic instruction on gangs that operate in New York. The training covers issues such as approaching an incident with caution, noting egress and secondary exit points, dealing with potential danger of, <clears throat> I'm sorry, sir, and dealing with potential danger by removing agitators. Members learn techniques such as observing the location before exiting the vehicle, clearing an exit path that allows retreat and if necessary, maintaining an appropriate distance from onlookers and owning the scene. Throughout the training, the instruction emphasizes that a member's safety is of the utmost importance. As the presentation puts it, your life comes first. EMS members also receive training on techniques borrowed from law enforcement regarding the use of verbal judo. This is, this is a uh, procedure employing communications tools to de-escalate a situation that has become heated and using judgment to decide when to find safety. They learn tactical communication strategies designed to elicit voluntary compliance from members of the public. This includes instruction on using language, inflection, tone, and nonverbal cues to control a situation. The training also focuses on the importance of communication and providing the patient with an explanation of what is happening in order to make the patient more likely to accept care without complication. Members also receive a training, a training on the th therapeutic communication derived from the New York State Department of Health curriculum. They learn to control a situation with a calm approach in order to obtain the trust and cooperation of the patient and onlookers, minimizing the risk of a confrontation. This curriculum addresses specific approaches for different types of patients, including communicating with elderly persons, with a child, with the hard of hearing and or deaf patients, or visually impaired patients and others. Once on the job, EMS members complete training periods to refresh what they've and to explore new material. In addition to the extensive refresher they receive every three years, they receive an additional Bureau of Training update that covers new policies, equipment, and rotating training topics. The topics for 2019 Bureau of Training update will include a review of tactical communications and a refresher on the Street, street Smart curriculum. In approaching the scene, members are able to refer to the premise history from a location of a call. If a computer-aided dispatch notification indicates the presence of violence or weapons or combative individuals, members may notify the police department and await the arrival of law enforcement officers before approaching the patient. However, because members are sometimes encounter dangerous situations without the presence of law enforcement, operational protocols also enable members to remove themselves from danger. This is the preferred method of dealing with a threat to physical danger, a threat of physical danger. Members are instructed to alert their supervisors and law enforcement and, if necessary, retreat from the scene. In a situation where members are attacked with physical violence, they have the ability to use an appropriate amount of force to protect themselves and to get to safety. There are two different radio calls that may be appropriate for members who need help who are in danger when they both trigger the immediate response of the nearest EMS unit and officers as well as the police. We have a great deal of confidence in our training and operational protocols. However, we also know that our approach to safety must evolve based on what we see in the field. This administration has been proactive about strengthening protections for our members. In 2015, we worked with our member unions, with Senator Marty Golden, and with Assemblymember Joel Lentil to pass bipartisan legislation making any assault against an on-duty EMS member a felony punishable by up to seven years in prison. In 2018, working hand-in-hand -hand with our union partners, 
the department announced that all FDNY ambulances would feature decals prominently displayed promoting the strong penalties for assaults against EMS members. The, fire to, the first ambulances to receive those decals were the ones in use at Station 26 up in the Bronx. Station 26 was home to EMT Yadira Arroyo, a 14-year veteran of the department who was struck and killed in the line of duty in 2017 while attempting to protect her partner and stop the theft of her ambulance. The decals serve as a reminder to anyone who assaults EMS personnel that they will face severe punishment. We've also made proactive changes to our training and equipment that are designed to enhance member safety. The mental performance initiative training, which currently focuses on a member's individual mental well-being, has been adapted to include de-escalation techniques and instruction on resetting a conversation that has become hostile. We've made design changes to the radios carried by the EMS members to make it easier for them to monitor police activity and facilitate with each other <clears throat> and the local, law, local precinct. As we analyzed incidents of assault in the recent years, we zeroed in on a number of instances that were members were spit upon. We look for solutions to protect our members from this repulsive occurrence. We're now in the process of acquiring spit hoods for use with, for patients in this situation. The fire department serves the people of New York and the backbone of this department is its members who save lives every day. We will always continue to look for ways to improve the safety of our members. We will be happy to take your questions at this time. <clears throat> Thank you uh, very much. I certainly appreciate your testimony. Uh, is the donut good? The donut is appropriate, sir. Thank you. Um, do, do we have a problem with EMS uh, assaults? Yes, I believe we do. Um, how much money does the department spend annually on either equipment or training to protect EMS personnel from assaults? I'll defer to the chief of training on the uh, financial issue and training, sir. Thank you very much. Um, is, is learning verbal judo part of the training program or is that a separate training? Um, in other words, is that part of the initial training to become an EMS uh, uh, a paramedic or an EMS agent or is that a separate training that was done in, in response to an assault? So, so uh, verbal judo is covered under a presentation we call tactical communications. We've been doing this presentation for at least eight years now. We did update it as, as time goes on and we see different problems in the field, we will update it. But it is uh, focused on verbal de-escalation and controlling a scene verbally, uh, as well as situational awareness. Uh, it is coupled with a presentation called Street Smarts, which has always been a, a presentation that we give to our new employees as well. That particular one is, uh, talks about how to remain safe, how to remain aware in field situations. For example, positioning yourself, making sure there is a way out at all times, um, being sure that you have your radio available to you. We talk about safety in other areas as well, uh, subways and, and, and hallways and where to stand in front of a door. Um, we do everything in our, in our power during these presentations to emphasize retreat. Right, so, so we don't want our people hurt and we work in a very ele emotionally elevated situation many times. So the thing that we emphasize during this training is de-escalate if you can and we give them strategies and tactics to do so. If, the, if it seems as though th those tactics are not gonna help, uh, call for help and retreat to safety. And, and we make sure that all of our members understand that's what we want from a training perspective. We want them to retreat to a safe place. Do, do we know the number of assaults uh, on EMS workers in 2018? Yes, we do. There's uh, 117, sir. Do we know the number during 2017? Yes, sir, 166. 166? 166. And do we know from 2016? 97. Do you, is there any rationale of why there was a 
gigantic increase from 2016 to 2017? It could be uh, improved reporting uh, st uh, strategies. Uh, there could also be uh, additional assaults uh, in, in that period of time. And historically, uh, you know, just, just roughly over the last 10 years, what has the average uh, assaults per year been? Um, I can't give you 10 years, sir. I can give you the numbers back to 2015, and then we'd have to do the math. Okay. So in 2015, it was 79. 2016, it was 97. 2017, 166. Last year, 117. This year to date, nine. So we're, we're on pace this year for a, a, a good year, I, I would say, uh, so far, but that doesn't answer for, what were the increased reporting strategies that you mentioned? We made uh, workplace violence, uh, we have a, a additional report that we have now uh, put in play. Uh, in the past, it was uh, an unusual occurrence report that sometimes didn't actually uh, hit all the marks that we need. So now we have a separate workplace violence policy and we have a separate workplace violence report. Um, that goes to the OSHA coordinator and the workplace violence coordinator within the fire department. So there's more awareness of the need to document uh, these incidences. Um, so, so, but still over the last two years, there's a pretty significant rise from the previous years. You're talking minimum 20, 20 percent or so. Yes. Okay. Um, have we given have we given EMS workers uh, masks over the years? We provide uh, the members of EMS with uh, a, a number of uh, two different types of uh, masks. We provide them with an N95 mask. They look, it's almost like a surgical mask. And that's to protect them from uh, tuberculosis and airborne issues and when they encounter a patient who has a communicable disease. We've also given uh, the members of uh, EMS since I believe 2001 after the Trade Center we gave them the Millennium MSA uh, mask, which works on a, uh, it looks like more of a, uh, a military grade mask mm -hmm. for exposure to uh, tear gas, airborne contaminants, dust particles to protect their respiratory system in general when they go into an environment such. Before the mask, uh, the, the first mask you mentioned was given, how many uh, EMS workers were stricken with tuberculosis in any year? I couldn't uh, reference that number, sir. Was it 118? Not to my knowledge, sir. I mean, I, I, I guess the point I'm trying to make is that when we had a, a problem that was comparatively smaller, uh, the department was, was pretty eager to, to give some equipment to address uh, a problem. Now we have a, an issue where there's 118 people in the past year and 166 the year prior. Um, has anything physically been given to EMS workers to prevent injuries from assaults? So what we're in the process of doing is that We've just already described that when somebody is in an environment where they're going to be physically assaulted, we would prefer them to extricate themselves from the environment as best they can. If they can take their patient with them, that would be great. Um, when we have an individual who has been uh, contained and or restrained by law enforcement, the, uh, the spitting comes uh, to uh, mind. Anybody can spit while they're handcuffed or restrained. So we are in the process of purchasing uh, a spit hood. I have a, a sample here uh, that I could show you, and it is a mesh hood that basically is fitted over the patient's. Uh, I'm not getting a good idea. I think you might you might have to. You, you might you have to give us. Do you really a, want no, me I'm, to? No, I'm kidding. I'm, I'm kidding. Because I will. No, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. <laughs> Please, so the, the hood is basically to keep the individual who is spitting at them from spitting at them. They'll spit, but it'll stay in the hood. So we're in the process of, of purchasing that and rolling that out. There's some training that's involved because anytime you put anything near a patient's airway, over their head, near their mouth, their nose, there's always an opportunity for complication. So we want the training to be appropriate, we want the awareness to be appropriate, and the use to be appropriate. So in, in your eighth paragraph of your testimony, you talked about uh, the <coughs> interactions between EMS uh, and NYPD. Um, I, I guess the first question I have is, uh, on a percentage of calls, how often uh, is a response with the NYPD triggered, stemming from an EMA, uh, stemming from a 911 call? I don't know the actual number. I can tell you it is less than when uh, I was on the ambulance. But is, is, is it a fraction of, of the calls? Is it uh, half the calls? Is it, uh, you know, ballpark? I, I couldn't put a number on it, sir, for you. Is there, uh, and I, I know you mentioned a, um, if an EMS worker is uh, 
being faced with a, a potential assault situation, uh, there is a radio code to call in additional units and the police. Is there a code in the 911 system that will automatically do that at the call time? If in fact we have information that there is a, uh, uh, an event occurring at the assignment where the ambulance is responding to, um, the dispatcher, if available, will record that information in the job text and that will be conveyed to the unit that's responding if it's available to the dispatcher. Use caution, there's a fight at the scene, there's a shooting, the perp might still be there, things along those lines. Absent that information to the dispatcher to provide to the ambulance crew, we're going to rely on their training, their observation when they pull into the block, when they look at the street, in order to make an informed decision of whether or not it's safe to actually approach the location or not, or they're going to need to wait for the police. In your, in your experience, if someone called 911 and they said that it, it seemed to be an emotionally disturbed person uh, behaving erratically uh, on the sidewalk, would that trigger uh, an NYPD and EMS response? Yes, an, an NYPD response to, to emotionally disturbed persons is, is uh, uh, I would say, all the time. Um, so I was in the state legislature, and I, you know, I actually remember some of the, uh, the, the bills that were passed. Um, <coughs> how many people since 2015 have been uh, charged and prosecuted with assaulting uh, an EMS worker? I cannot give you back to 2015, sir, but I can tell you that uh, in the year of 2018, we have uh, a record of uh, 21 arrests. Um, some of those uh, cases are uh, in the criminal justice system. Others have been handled with criminal summonses. Um, and uh, that's where we are for 2018, sir. And just going back to the equipment, um, the masks were done sort of reactionary uh, in response. Are there any instances where the FDNY was proactive uh, in, in, in giving equipment to EMS workers before uh, incidents became problematic? Yes. And, we were, and the 9-11 masks certainly are an example of that. But Right. So be, before um, the incidents became problematic in, in the process of uh, purchasing a new radio system and a communication system, we have just recently rolled out the Motorola APX 8000 portable radio. In the planning phases of that, in the programming of that radio, we organized the uh, police frequencies directly adjacent to the EMS frequency with the turn of a knob without having to look at the radio. The older radio, you had to, to navigate your way through several screens, and it was very, very difficult to get to a police frequency if you needed emergent help. Um, this radio has streamlined that process, so if you, sir, were working in Lower Manhattan today, you would be on the Lower Manhattan EMS frequency if you were to be a victim of, a, of an assault or an aggressive patient, you could turn the radio two or three clicks and you'd be right on the police frequency <coughs> of the police officers that are actually in the police cars, in the precinct where you are engaging in this activity at this point. And the radio announces where you are. So you don't have to look at the radio. If you turn that knob, it'll tell you Manhattan South, Manhattan Central, 17th Precinct, 18th Precinct. That is an enhancement that we planned on with the communications equipment to get you help. One other thing we did is in previous episodes of the portable radio, when you hit the emergency alert beacon on the radio that sent out an emergency message that you were in distress, a nine-digit radio number came up on the dispatcher screen. We had to look and see who had that nine-digit radio. This administration has used technology to now link that radio with that individual EMS member by their badge number and their name. So I know that if Chief Booth hits the emergency alert beacon, my beacon goes off. The dispatcher knows they're looking for Chief Booth. They're just not looking for anybody. They're looking for me specifically. So that enhances accountability and safety. Thank you. Uh, I just want to recognize we're here also with Councilmembers Brannon and Cabrera. Nice to see you guys. Do you have a question? Okay. Uh, I just have two more, and then I'll hand it off. Um, you made me forget what I was going to say, you know? <laughs> Impress you that much. How, how many uh, of the 118 or 166 from 2017, uh, just rough averages, how many of those assaults took place in the presence of a police officer? I don't have that information, sir. Is it more likely or less likely that the assaults happen in the, in the presence of a police officer? I, I don't have the information, sir, to make the reference. Um, do you think that there are other fire departments uh, and uh, you know, uh, 
agencies that also handle EMS around the country that do a better job in protecting EMS workers? I don't know if they do a better job. I'm sure they're confronted with the same issues that we are confronted with, and we'd be interested in, 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 in learning anything we could from another agency. Just because we do it a lot more doesn't mean we do it better, sir. So anything they could teach us, we'd be interested in. Uh, Councilmember Cabrera, questions, please. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Chair. I just had a simple question. Uh, you, you were talking about technology. Uh, have any vendors approached you with new technology coming in the horizon? So first of all, it's good to see you again, sir. I've Likewise. Seen you before. Good to um, see you, Chief. I do not uh, deal directly with vendors. Um, uh, Technology-wise, um, we have a medical equipment committee and a research and development group that deals with uh, any type of device that's carried on either fire apparatus or an ambulance in, in, the, in the fire department. Okay. So, uh, no, sir. The answer to your question is no. Okay. And then in terms of training, has uh, for the new, uh, tr for the new uh, class, uh, has there been any changes in the training uh, versus previous years? Anything in the curriculum or in the training that... Uh, that has changed. I'm going to defer to Chief Bonsignor from yes. the Bureau of Training. Thank Good you, afternoon, Chief. Good afternoon, sir. Uh, there actually has. So um, we're, we're, we've added several things to our curriculum, including enhancing the street smarts and tactical communications presentations that they get. Uh, we did also include um, something called Mental Performance Initiative that Chief Booth mentioned during his opening remarks. And that really teaches about how to gain self awareness, how to gain self-control in, in a heated environment, so basically how to reset a situation uh, when things are starting to get out of control. So that's been included in all of our new employee classes as well. And uh, uh, do we have uh, empirical data substantiating that methodology, uh, th this new methodology in terms of the interaction they have or whoever they're coming with? This, this initiative was based right out of military and, and sports uh, environments because they, they're two very highly emotional areas and, and uh, we, like, like Chief Booth was saying, we're interested in learning from everywhere that we can. And that level of unlocking your best potential, uh, resetting your, your emotions during a highly elevated or stressful situation we found to be helpful. So during our, during our coursework, um, our, our students are introduced to stressful environment that they would see normally in the field. Of course, it is a training environment, so we can't be as, you know, we can't put them in the field to do this, but we run them through coursework. Uh, then we give them this information and then we give them some practice on box breathing, um, physical reset, self-talk, things like that. And then we run them through the situations similar to that again and we have seen positive results there. Uh, we are also, not for only our new employee classes, but for our, our, our EMS membership in total, working on a, a de-escalation video that we could put up on something we call Diamond Plate, which is our training platform. So we, we have an AV unit that is working on that currently. And we're also, uh, during this one day uh, training that we call Bureau Training Updates, we are, giving all of our EMS members training on street smarts and, and de-escalation techniques through uh, tactical communications. Uh, you know, one of my experiences uh, that I had, you know, I was involved in 9-11 and um, right there in Ground Zero and also with Fly 587. I've been in a lot of Haiti, <clears throat> a lot of places where you had critical incidents. And one of the uh, things that I value and is uh, the debriefing piece. Then whenever you encounter uh, critical incidents, there's an opportunity for debriefing. Do you have that standardized? Is there a systematic way that every time one of the EMS workers encounters violence, encounters you know, a, a, a critical incident, something that is very potent in terms of their, you know, impacting their mental health, do, do, do we have something that is that is standardized, where they get, uh, they have an opportunity to talk about it, debrief, uh, that it's not left by chance? The simple answer to that, sir, is yes. We have a counseling services unit. We have uh, counselors that are available, peer counselors, as well as uh, higher trained professionals, that if we had gone to uh, a substantial event, 
where we had a lot of fatalities or we had a very stressful situation or the members were assaulted or uh, God forbid a child in a bad situation. Um, we're very aware of the mental health uh, needs uh, of, of our members and um, they have the ability to avail themselves to that and we also have the supervisors um, with during the r and r period the rest and rehabilitation period after a, a large event um, we evaluate the members and basically see if they're squared away and if they're not they're uh, able to seek those services and then we follow up with them that's incumbent upon their officer uh, to, to keep an eye on them as so who does the request uh, the ems worker or the supervisor might see some flags and say hey we got a situation here because you know usually and NYPD, uh, fire department, EMS, I mean, the posture is usually one of I'm strong, people look to you for strength. So uh, there's, you know, defenses that you build up to, to be able to cope. I'm just curious as to is there a mechanism in place that if you start seeing red flags, we could deal with it early on. So, you know, the post-traumatic stress that they're dealing with or the onset of it, I still with early on because you know as you know it gets more complicated as as, as it develops. Yeah, so e either or, sir, the, the okay. either the, the the member can uh, make application and 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 look to get into these programs, or the officer that supervises them can can make these observations and see that maybe they're not 100 percent or that there's something going on in their life that they may need assistance with, and they can route them uh, to get the assistance that they need. Have you ever done a survey with EMS workers? Uh, it's my last question, uh, Mr. Chair. Thank you for the time. Uh, a, a survey uh, to assess uh, what kind of extra services EMS workers would like to have in terms of, uh, of support, of, you know, extra support. Have we ever done a, an actual survey? Uh, in, in, under my tenure, the past four and a half years, sir, we have not done that survey. I know in the past, uh, EMS had some issues uh, that needed to be addressed, and they were addressed through the Counseling Services Program. During those periods of time, there was data collection that was many years ago, sir. So that's what I can speak to. Okay. Uh, it would be kind of interesting to do a survey and see, hey, uh, these are you know, what other services would you like to have to have the support? Because, you know, it's a very intense, you were talking about the, the new, uh, I forgot the name. The, the performance. What is it? Mental Performance Initiative. Mental, we, we could use that here at the council too. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, uh, so it, it'd be interesting to see if there's anything else. Um, so you have an exchange of ideas. It's free information, right. you know, it's hot, up to press, you're dealing, with them firsthand. So I want to thank you. Thank you for all that you do. Uh, keep up the good work, and I'll turn it back over uh, to, the, uh, to the chair. Thank you for the extra time. And uh, I'll, I'll just give it to Mr. Browning. Thank you, Chair. Uh, just really quickly, I mean, not so much data-driven, but just anecdotally, I mean, over the past 10, 20 years, how has is, how is the game changed for, for people on the job in EMS? I think the game has changed with the uh, workload um, that we're faced with, uh, the uh, amount of assignments they're exposed to, um, and the, the, the many things that uh, they have to manage while they're, they're treating a, a patient. Um, we didn't have K2 uh, 20 years ago. We didn't have uh, substances like that that cause people to engage in the activities that they engage in. Um, so that being one of the things, there, I'm sure there are others, but that's one of them. And the additional trainings that you've mentioned, um, those have come to be over the past how many years? Okay. Uh, the, the training is, is always developing. Uh, I could tell but I mean you with these added sort of dealing with the public so, kind of. So over, I would say over the last two years or so. Okay. I, I've, been, I've been at the academy for three years, almost three years now. And that's one of the first things that we started to work on. So two years, it's up and running. Three years ago, we started working on it. And we continue to, to look for other opportunities to teach our members to, to you know, be safe at all times. And I mean, from the days when you were riding in an ambulance till now, I mean, how much has it changed on the streets? I think the work uh, of dealing with 
ill and injured people is always going to be what it is. I think that the environment that they're encountering uh, is ever evolving and changing. It is different from 1983 when I came on the job to what it is now um, as far as the population of the city, the diversity of the city, the different customs in the city. Uh, they, they're dealing with a, uh, a cornucopia of uh, issues in their daily activities. Sure. Oh, thank you. I just have a few more for you. Uh, what information is tracked uh, w when there's a, a violence report what information is tracked as far as the injuries uh, and as far as the prosecution of the potential assaulter? The um, injuries uh, are uh, well, the injuries are documented on a line of duty injury report that goes to that's a Bureau of Health Services document. The other document is a workplace violence report, and that outlines uh, the basic uh, uh, description of the event: uh, who was injured, who wasn't injured. Uh, the uh, perpetrator's name and, and things along those lines. Um, and uh, those two documents uh, contain the, the, the activity, the, the dealings of that event. Um, is, is there any tracking that is, non, is not restricted by HIPAA of the injuries? In other words, can, can you tell us how serious the injuries are or how unserious they are? I think once, once the person enters the Bureau of Health Services in, environment, we're basically precluded from knowing anything other than their full duty or their light, out line of duty or their modified duty based on their injury. No, I'm not really available to look and say, well, you know, is the arm broken in four places or is it just a sprain? Um, so out of, the, say, the 117, uh, how many uh, re required a modification of their duty status? I don't have that information, sir. Um, when were uh, EMS workers outfitted with uh, ballistic vests? I would like to say roughly 20 years ago, sir. And, and how, were they, uh, how were they stowed in the, in the ambulance? Are they, are they worn? Are they required to be worn? Are they stowed uh, until needed? They're, there is, uh, they're at the member's discretion, and they are stowed uh, in their equipment bag uh, or uh, other suitable location inside the ambulance until they're needed. Is there a shelf life with ballistic vests? I've uh, been told that there is a shelf life. I'm, I'm not an, an expert on shelf life, um, but I, each manufacturer would dictate what their product can and can't do. Do we know all the, if, if all the vests are within their shelf life, their manufacturer's suggested shelf life? I do not have the... Uh, knowledge that each and every vest is with, within the manufacturer's shelf life, so no. And the last allocation uh, funding from uh, the city to the, for the purchase of vests was in, in 1998, 99? No, sir. The vests are purchased as we hire new uh, members. So uh, when we hire a, a new class of probationary uh, members, um, they're able to be outfitted uh, with the vests. So the, the, we continue to buy vests. Um, are there certain types of calls that are more likely to generate a, a police response in addition to EMS? In other words, uh, if, if there's a domestic violence situation, I imagine that would automatically trigger a police response as well. But are, are there other situations where, uh, just from experience, you could ascertain that there's more likely to be a violent incident at this type of response versus any other? A kid, kid falls off a bike, you're not going to send the police, right? But if, if uh, someone's injured in, in, the, in, the, in the process of a crime, is there, does that trigger some automatic response? In my experience, yes. If, if, the, if the 911 operator is in receipt of information that says the person is a victim of a crime or there's an ongoing aggressive act at the scene or there's an emotionally disturbed individual that is endangering themselves or others, that is more likely to generate a police response. Okay, I think that's it that I have for you guys. Thank you very much. Take, take some donuts on the Thank way. Thank you for the donuts, sir. Thank you're you. welcome. You're welcome. Next, we will have Mr. Oren Barzali and Michael Greco of Local 2507.
It's always nice to see you guys. Oh, yeah. Um, good, good circumstances. I guess we will start with uh, Mr. Barzell. Thank you. And thank you for allowing me to speak here today. My name is Owen Barzale, president of FDNY EMS Local 2507, uniformed EMTs, paramedics, and fire inspectors. Providing pre-hospital patient care can be dangerous. EMTs and paramedics face se several health and safety risks during each and every shift. EMTs and paramedics suffer work-related fatalities more than two times more frequently than the national average. Transportation-related injury is five times greater than the national average. While willing to accept the inherent risk associated with their chosen profession, they should not be expe expected to accept being assaulted as part of providing emergency care to the sick and injured. EMT Yadira Arroyo, a mom of five, was crushed to death under the wheels of her ambulance, and her partner was injured after they tried to shoot the man off the back of the ambulance. On August 10, EMT Stephen Field and EMT Timothy McGurk, which are sitting in, in behind me, responded to a call in Brooklyn. Upon entering the premises, standing side by side with NYPD, shots rang out, striking the officer three times, missing our members. Our members treated Officer Nigun without hesitation or concern for their own safety. These members received citations for their heroic efforts by the NYPD. December 12th, Brooklyn, an incident that was caught on video at which two city EMTs suffered serious injuries when an angry man assaulted them as they responded to an emergency medical in, Bro in Brooklyn. That incident came just a few days after two EMTs responded to a call in Far Rockaway, Queens, finding themselves confronted an irate man with a knife who attempted to slash them. While transferring patient to a hospital stretcher, patient became agitated and violent and bit the member saying, I have AIDS. I hope you get it and die. While escorting a patient into an emergency department, a patient became verbally abusive, abusive and struck a member with a metal cane in the head. After starting an IV on a patient and administering medication, patient became irate and punched the member in the face and pulled out an IV causing blood to be splashed all over the member. While sitting in an ambulance with the window open, a person walked up to the vehicle, punched the member in the face, and then proceeded to choke him until he passed out. As you can see, these incidents run the gamut of criminal behavior. In 2018, EMS personnel suffered 156 assaults. That translates to one incident every 56 hours of the working year. To compound this dire situation, the Fire Department Bureau of Investigation often prosecutes and fines members who find it necessary to restrain combative, violent individuals. In 2015, the state legislator upgraded assaulting a pre-hospital provider to a Class D felony, punishable by up to seven years of incarceration. These men and women are deserving of protection as well as respect. However, when, assaulted, when assaults occur, occur, in most incidents, the district attorney, without regard to the aforementioned respect and protection, will attempt to enter into a plea bargaining agreement that reduces the charge to a low class of misdemeanor. The presiding judge often sets the case to no bail and releases the perpetrator on ROR. The true issue at hand lies in the fact that prosecuting offenders and affixing warning stickers to ambulances is reactive, not proactive. I have made numerous suggestions to the department that would allow my members to better protect themselves in a protective manner. Training members in tactical communication skills would empower the provider with an inventory of skills to better diffuse confrontations, de-escalate potential violence, and better diffuse confrontations. 
which will also generate voluntary compliance. Also in conjunction with tactical communication training, a course of self-defense should be instituted. A tailored self-defense course will primarily teach the member how to create space to escape a threat, secondarily allow the member to protect themselves, and finally, if absolutely necessary, neutralize the life-threatening situation. The replacement of outdated ballistic vests is so long overdue, expired body armor does not provide adequate protection against deadly force. These suggestions have been largely ignored by the FDNY. The problem of assaults on EMTs and paramedics will not resolve itself. As a result of this department benign neglect, the EMS profession has no lessons learned, no best practices, and no reliable interventions to reduce the risk of violence or violence-related injuries. The idea of educating and warning the public about the consequences of assaulting an EMT or an EMS personnel has failed. The only viable option is adopting the enumerated training modules. Adopting these ideas may just prevent another member from being seriously assaulted or murdered. While, si while sitting here and hearing the department's testimony. It's been two years, in two weeks, will be two years since Yadira Arroyo was murdered. Other than the department installing 10 units with a VISTA system, which automatically disengages the ambulance when a threat is present, that's 10 out of hundreds of units. When an individual gets assaulted, there's a human nature of a reaction. It's natural to respond when somebody spits on you or punches you in the face. Yet when our members respond, they're disciplined. The city needs to identify our members. The department needs to identify our members. We had members terminated for protecting themselves. They spoke about a street smart program. That's a program that should be taught at junior high school. It's for the lay person. Slides are not gonna teach anybody anything. It's taught by one of my colleagues and other EMS members. We need professionals to give these classes. We need advanced classes, not some slides, not some projections. People who know how to diffuse and de-escalate situations. There was a question raised about CSU on debriefing. There's no debriefing. We can hardly maintain our call volume now. Our members have no time to go debrief. When there's major disasters, mass casualties, our members get no debriefing. We've asked for that numerous times. Counseling service unit, yeah, it's offered to our members, but you have to burn your sick time or vacation time to go see them. It's not provided to, on the department. Many of our members don't report these assaults because of a lack of action that's done by the department or the police department, the district attorney's office, all parties involved. It builds a tradition of inaction to cause our members to report these incidents. There's no reasons our members are sitting at street corners at two, three o'clock in the morning. The department needs to take our people off the streets in high crime neighborhoods and put them in safe houses. Another question that was asked if PD responds to all our calls. The police department does not respond to all our calls. They do not have the resources as well to respond to all our calls. 
there's a code that comes in with every EMS run. In every job, it's printed. Command order 12, EM NYPD not necessary on this run. And on many of these instances is where the assaults take place. Your, your routine sick job can turn into a nightmare. That's it for me. Mike, would you mind if I ask just questions just to follow up? Yeah, no, of course. Um, I just want to go over this, uh, the, the uh, disciplinary procedures for uh, EMS workers who, who use force. Um, so, you, so members have been terminated for using force? We had an incident last year, and Mike will go into depth since he deals with the uh, discipline aspect of our job. Yeah, we've had... Um a member terminated after spitting on, after the patient spit on her. Um, the, the oath and the DOH ruled that due to the fact that it was a second punch, that there, sh there should, they, they, it's not good. So they, they, they started to terminate her. And, and it's not just termination. But other members have been fined? Fine. I'm actually, I have one case now, it's, it's lack of investigation, really. Um, I have one case going on right now, two members. Um, the patient was restrained by one arm onto the stretcher. So uses the right arm, and this is the story as told by the members and one of the triage nurses. Used the arm, started punching. He ends up putting his hands on him. Uh, patient complained, and actually one of the PD members who, I don't know why he was only restrained on one hand, but ended up contacting his patrol supervisor and saying there was probably something off here. So the Bureau of Investigation and Trials interviewed the officer, interviewed the members, the two members, never interviewed anybody else, and just assumed that the police officer's version, there's no video, there's, so they assumed that one side, because he's a police officer, it must be correct. The exact words were, well, I believe him, why would, why, why would he lie? I, I don't understand why anybody will lies, but anybody knows about perception. There's the old um, cartoon where you got two men sitting with the number six. So and how, how, how often are fines levied uh, for this? A couple times a year or? Probably a couple times a year. And it, it all depends on what story comes out with beliefs. Because CCU, which is the Civilian Complaint Unit, um, anybody who calls in and makes a complaint, it's immediately looked at as, okay, we have to investigate the crew. So when they're investigating the crew, it's, again, a belief. This isn't a court of law, and they throw it in our face all the time. Well, we don't have the same preponderance of evidence. We don't uh, the same rules of, uh, you know, beyond a reasonable doubt. For them, it's 51%, mm -hmm. and it really comes down to who they believe. So if I'm in a fight for my life against somebody, but this person complains and let them. The, the video that went viral about two months ago, uh, where it, it looks like it was a, a scrap. I mean, it was a, it was a, was anyone, uh, any employee of the FDNY fined or disciplined or investigated? Nobody was disciplined on that one. Okay. But now that video, I mean, I don't like to Monday morning call it. I think that's 44 seconds of a perfect microcosm to what the department says they're doing and what's going on. That call was about 20 minutes. Mm -hmm. um, nobody had the time to come over the radio and give a proper they call it a 1012. That's the expl explanation of the situation. Nobody gave a 1012 of what was going on. It wasn't until 12 minutes into the call that a 911 caller gave the best example of what was going on. So, because things get so crazy, that little, it brings me to what I was, you know, I didn't have anything prepared, but I'm just kind of answering the department. That radio training that they called proactive. It's not. Radios have been a problem since 9-11, if not before. So they've always had to readjust. That training for the members was mixed in in a four-hour CME, we call it, continuing education. So is, is there a scenario where there could be a, uh, a penalty against a member for use of force if he or she was first sort of uh, accosted? Let's use the example you gave. So the patient is partially restrained. Uh, restrained. They grab your member. Your member uses some sort of force to free himself or herself, push the person away. Is there a scenario where they can be fined despite not having any training physically 
on how to, in other words, the police department has a standard of training for physical, we, we saw this play out with Eric Garner, when the, the debate was over whether the officer in question used the chokehold that he or she was trained for. So this, in this case, there is no physical training, and a member can be held liable for uh, using whatever means they can to sort of protect themselves. The short answer is yes, um, that does happen. Because it all depends, again, who the department believes. If you interview four people, two people have one side, two people have another side. If the department believes the two people who are complaining against you, then yes. With no, with no evidence whatsoever, it's just a matter of belief. And again, that particular situation, they talk about retreating. That member is on, uh, that patient is on our stretcher. So if you retreat, it's claiming safety issue, and he's flailing around and he falls on that, now a different UOR is created where the member, I mean, the patient got injured in your care. Is there any civil liability with that? For the member? Um, that, I, uh, that I know of, I'm sure, uh, in today's day and age with lawsuits. Um, there hasn't been any incident in your knowledge where a member was sued personally and then. If so, so there are instances where they, the person decides to sue the department, there are, but it doesn't involve our members. Right, okay. But for, for car accidents, for instance, our members get subpoenaed themselves by the victim all the time. Are there any, any times where uh, either an EMS worker or a member of the fire department or any, any employee of the FDNY, let's say, uh, f transmit over the radio a request for the police to come and they are unable to respond? Yes. Right. So, so there is plenty of scenarios where the determination was made that there ought to be a police officer present and those resources, whether they're unavailable or, you know, or some, somebody in the decision-making chain decides not to send them, that, ha that has happened. Well, th there's a mechanism for our members to call for help, but it goes to a third person, a fourth person sometimes. So you're on the street, I'm your dispatcher, you call me, I now have to send a message to a police operator who is not directly over there with, with that uh, frequency, for instance. She now has to send a message to that borough frequency telling him there's an emergency going on with EMS, send somebody. So there's, there's a lag sometimes. Even if the resource is available and a police officer is, you know, 500 feet away around the corner, out, you know, out of visual range, let's say, uh, it would take a, it could a minute. Unless they get on the police frequency, there's a delay. Imagine texting your mother to text your father who then text your brother to come help you. I'm, I, my, I, I don't even right. want to think about and, that. And yeah. That's why I use those same exact yeah. people for that reason, because that's what it's Sorry, like. Sorry, Mom, if you're watching. Yeah. Sorry about that. Trust me, you have a question. Uh, uh, Michael, do you want, you want to make a testimony? Yeah, I mean, just a couple of things. We, we touched on dispatch. The communication at PD is terrible. Um, the, the spit hoods they're talking about, they've been in development for two years, and it gets stalled because of colors. They had a white and a black hood. Black hood, they felt, and the white hood, they felt, was, you know, certain racial connotations. So it got delayed while they asked the company to create a new hood with just a beige color. Those are the delays um, that they worry about. The radio strap, um, if you've ever seen a radio strap, it goes across. That's not only a choke hazard, uh, it's also... Um, it gets caught up on banisters, it gets caught up, it falls, it hits patients in the face, and our members are disciplined if they're not wearing their radio strap, even though they have a belt holder. And we've approached to the department and said, why can't you let them use the belt? And well, no, you have to, it's, it's an order. You have to wear the radio strap. So these are the sort of things, they asked about proactive, you asked about proactive, they're not. They're, they're, they're very reactionary. The, the debriefing that he touched on, it's a culture problem. Um, these, you asked the question, I was gonna start off with a joke, but instead I'll start it here. When you said when you guys were on the ambulance, what well, changes have, well, horse and buggies was one of them. Um, cell phones, audio recordings, um, internet, those are all the things that have changed. These are the people who sit up here that if this sort of stuff happened in 1983, they'd probably hit them with an oxygen bottle to get away. And we've been told in those, oh, you know, you, you guys have to know how to handle yourself. It's different with, with cameras nowadays, a 14 second clip, even though for the rest of the 10 minutes you were completely in the right. Things have changed and the people who are in charge, while they have good intentions, don't understand what's going on. A, a, a video on dining plate they talked about, 
if you're going to show me a de-escalation, that's their answer. I'm looking for a trained professional to come in and teach us how to de-escalate a situation. And you're going to throw it on a 30 minute video that we have to watch on our own time when we're busy. The fire department, the firefighters, they train constantly. They get taken out of service. They get sent to Randall's Island. They practice their craft. They practice things because of our call volume because of our understaffed, because we're running down 100 tours a day, we can't be taken off service. The counseling service they speak about, oh, they'll, they'll call us first of all, the, there is no debriefing. And if we go to the counseling service, we might get the rest of the tour off. And if we need any other time, we don't have unlimited sick. So we get sent to the counseling service, and you need to use your own AL or your own um, sick leave to get that time. So. They're more worried about their stats of running ambulance than they are about the safety of the members. That's well, good. I'm sorry. I, th I thought you were finished. Sorry. No, no, no. I, I, you can give me a chance to talk. I'll keep going. Oh, well, <laughs> I just want to ask uh, two, two quick questions. The first is uh, about the number you gave for 2018. You said there was 156. That, that's different than the FDNY's number that they gave. Um, what, if, what, is there a discrepancy of? of that's, that's the number they gave us. Okay. So, so if, as, uh, as I was listening to it, in June of 2018, when those uh, decals came out, uh, there's a report that says, as, as of June, there's 87 incidents by the department. Mm -hmm. So halfway through the year, we had 87. Maybe one was a fiscal year, one was a calendar year, so I don't, but, but it doesn't seem like there's any big conspiracy or anything. Yeah. So. And keep in mind, a lot of our members do not report all incidents. Well, that was the next question. Uh, out of the, the, say, 156, uh, what are the type and, and scope of the injuries that have been received? Some of these injuries are permanent, <coughs> are disabling. Our members had to apply for, for, for early retirement because of these assaults. Um, without going into too much details, on a, a torn rotator cuff from somebody either punching you or pulling you, uh, we, we have a member right now who's permanently disabled, young, young individual in, the to, in their 20s, career over. What do you estimate the percentages of EMS workers who uh, file an accident report, report for assault uh, that end up being placed on some sort of duty modification? So, so to Pull them or is it? So we have a total of 10% people who are injured. Mm -hmm. uh, as, the but as, as, the, as far as the assaults go. Okay. As far as the assault, I don't know. Right. If, if you're getting assaulted to the point that something hurts, um, I think there's a very good reporting nature where you have to miss work because we go back to, again, with the um, whether we use our own time or not. So if, if you have a simple injury like a back strain, if you go line of duty injury, that time is not charged against your leave balance. So when it comes to needing time off and So healing. when someone's assaulted, there is an almost overwhelming likelihood that they will be out of service for the next week. Day no, or not, or not an overwhelming, because he spoke about um, the, the far end of the spectrum, the really serious ones. To go to the other end, there's a lot of punching, there's a lot of spitting, there's a lot of kicking. You, you strap a guy in an ambulance, you get kicked in the chest. Uh, it's become common nature that that is where, when I tell you, 25% of those get reported. I could probably have these guys shake their head right now if you reported every time somebody has put their hand on you. No, because one of two things, it, nothing's going to happen. The, the PD might not arrest. Oh, it's our supervisors, the same ones who've been around for 30 years. Oh, back in our day, this was nothing, you know. So the little ones don't get reported because it becomes, A, PD's not going to do anything, and our supervisors aren't going to care. So if it's significant enough that there causes any injury to us that is recognizable at the moment, they will go out. But if it's just a slap in the face, a, you got spit on your chest, you got just a, you know punched in the chest, and there's no real physical injury, it's not worth the uh, time and effort. That's I'll the point. That was joined by Councilman Mazel, who's hiding behind the donuts, which are available for his enjoyment. They got some of them have Lucky Charms on them. They're very very good. I had the Lucky Charms. I need a hole in my <laughs> well, luckily the donuts have a hole uh, already in them. So. <laughs> Uh, I, I don't have any more questions. Yeah, it's, and then they talk about, I mean, again, you let me go and I'll go. Um, they're call types. We respond to numerous, and this is the call type, unknown. Then that's the call type, mm -hmm. unknown. 
that, is, is there, but is no there, PD goes to that. To but is there then a procedure that the EMS worker, so in other words, if a call comes on as unknown, the EMS worker might by nature be more cautious, but is there a protocol where they should validate that it's a safe situation before entering? No, we, um, we go over and say, we go over the air and X, um, you know, there's no information. Instead of saying wait for PD or we're sending a boss, the answer we get over and over is check and advise. Yeah. So it's our job to figure out what the unknown, and then there's also the call type other, which is actually one of my favorite call types because of the extent of what an other could be. That means somebody on the phone went so crazy, they don't even know how to categorize it, so they just send it as an other. But those are the dangerous calls. Those are the ones where you show up and you don't know what's gonna happen. And the verbal judo, the two years that they're giving new people, um, it's not enough seriousness into the training. They need to stop putting it with other things. I, I don't think they don't take it seriously in the sense that they call it verbal judo. Right. And it started out as a lieutenant, because it's a book, I believe. It started out as a, as a lieutenant and higher type class that they're now incorporating into the lower. And I do believe the administration is on the right path. I don't want to knock the administration. Even uh, Chief Bonsignor, she's, she's great at the training aspect. She's, she's great at her job. I just think some of the bureaucracy and the two years for a hood, um, the micromanaging of if I'm not safe in a radio strap and I have a belt, it should be my decision on how to go about that call. You're, you give me a $300,000 ambulance. You give me a, an insane amount of drugs and insane amount of uh, autonomy to intubate, sedate, um, restrain, take care of cardiac arrests, and do all that. But when it comes to whether or not I can wear a, a belt or a strap, you have to micromanage that. When it comes to a uniform, you're going to tell me on which day I can wear a long, long, long sleeve and a short sleeve. It's just rest assured that if I was hit in the face with a radio uh, while I was in a stretcher, I'd, I'd file a, a complaint. Of course. Myself. Yeah, and I don't, I'm on the side of, it's not the self-defense that I feel is 100% needed. And I don't want weapons for our members because, again, the training that comes with weapons and we are the safe space for people to call. Self-defense, it should always be to get out. Scene safety and retreat is always the way to go. And if you do a self-defense course, the way they're going to teach it, they're going to have some guy who works in the Bronx who's going to come make a little overtime. It's going to be a, a four-hour training that you must retrain, retrain. That's any self-defense. But conflict resolution, um, how to approach a patient, how to de-escalate a situation, if that's taught in a four-hour class, dedicated, that would be more helpful. And I don't believe they're ready to bring in the experts. I think they're going to turn around and ask some guy, who might know somebody and they'll put it in a slide. A captain or a lieutenant should not be teaching. So just my last question, uh, considering the, the, the danger of the job, the number of assaults, the, the lack of interest that departments seem to take uh, with respect to preventing these types of assaults despite the rise, uh, why, you know, why do people stick around uh, uh, the EMS department when uh, g given the pay? Because we love it. It takes a special person. Um, a conductor on the Long Island Railroad had a heart attack today on my way in. Uh, St. Albans, they stopped the train for 45 minutes. They asked for a medical professional. I got up, I keep gloves in my pocket, and I've been doing this now for two years in the vice president. That is the most exciting thing for me because I get to go treat a patient. So two FDNY crews came in, took this guy to the hospital. That is why we do it because despite all the problems, EMS, this is a call, this is, this is a calling. A firefighter loves what he does. Police officers love what they do. Um, we love what we do. So we will keep doing it. And if I, did, if I had a council hearing that didn't mention the pay, that's, that's weird. If you're going to treat us like a, a service that gets beat up, that gets spit on, that gets punched, that gets whatever, and then tell me my job's not dangerous, tell me the work is different, mm -hmm. we're going to have issues. Thank you very much, Vance Booker. Yeah. Can we touch on the ballistic vests? Oh, yeah, if, if, if you'd like to, yeah, please. So I don't know if you saw the news this morning out in Oregon, a paramedic sitting in an ambulance was stabbed, minding his own business. Our vests are so outdated. Um, the, we've asked also for replacement policy. It falls on deaf ears. We have members with 20-year vests. Um, 
studies have shown that weapons technology has advanced. Those vests are useless at this point. Bullets have advanced, guns have advanced. Our members are out there with no protection. Uh, and just to echo some of what Mike has said, this is a passion to, to our people. With all that falls on their lap, they take it and they move forward. Thank you, Justice. Thank you. Is there anyone else who'd like to testify? Seeing none, thank you. Come on, Mike, they're gonna charge you.